Hey guys, I actually, I am Shiel Manat. I uh, run the FinTech Fund for 500 Startups. Obviously, uh, creatively named, I focus on FinTech. Uh, we've got a wonderful panel here of other vertical uh, focuses, foci. Um, Constance Friedman runs Modern Ventures uh, out of Chicago. They are a uh, early stage fund, no, early stage fund and late stage accelerator focused on real estate technologies, also in other, other real estate related fields like his insurance. Uh, Brendan Wallace runs uh, Fifth Wall Ventures, also focused on real estate. Uh, Sean O'Sullivan um, runs SOSV, not, not SOS Ventures, I was told, and um, runs a number of accelerator programs around the world. Uh, focused on biotech, hardware, China, mobile. Uh, I don't know, I can't even think of the rest. Disruptive food, food yeah. Disruptive food, would love to know what that means. Um, Dan Rosen from Commerce Ventures uh, focuses on retail and fintech investments. And Jason Lemkin from Saster uh, focused on SaaS, also building a media empire in the SaaS vertical. Um, so I thought we'd start out talking a little bit about um, what you guys see as advantages of being part of a, a vertically focused fund. Like, you know, some of us, you know, at one time I had the idea that it would be a lot more fun to invest in everything. Um, but over, over the past couple of years, I found that I'm not smart enough to invest in everything. So just being in one, in one vertical helps me, um, helps me get better in that one vertical. What are your thoughts? Well, when I started doing this, it was in 2008. And so launching a fund in 2008 was an interesting time. And um, so the world was falling apart. And the idea was, well, how do we do something that's going to be different? And how do we do something that's going to be unique and have longevity? You know, knowing we were first fund at that point and didn't have a brand name like a lot of other funds. And so um, to create differentiation, the you know going into something more vertical and thinking about how do we bring customers to our companies was the best way that I could think of how we could um, you know create that longevity and and survive those cycles ongoing and provide the most value to our companies and therefore the most value to our fund and so that was that was part of our strategy and um, staying vertical and being uh, well. Uh, I'm actually not, I mean, our, we have a focus on being vertical, so in real estate, finance, insurance, home services, but all of our companies are applicable in those areas, but also other verticals. And so our strategy is really help companies build credibility in these sectors, but be big enough that they can go into other markets so that we can make sure we can get those venture returns. Brendan, you started a company in another, another sector than what you invest in. Um, can you tell me about how you decided on investing in real estate technologies? Yeah, so um, my previous company was in HR tech, but I had a background in real estate prior to starting that. And as I started just angel investing like everyone else in like 2014 and 2015, I started to realize there's probably no two industries that are further apart than real estate and technology. Real estate is 13% of the US GDP. It's the largest industry in the US and it's a massive tech laggard and it under indexes on tech. And if you talk to a lot of venture funds and kind of their real estate theses, they're, they're interested in the category, but there's not a lot of people that have worked in the industry. So um, I had experience in the industry and our approach was, you have this huge industry where the ability of like the incumbents of kind of, you know, what Steve Case calls like third wave innovation, or the ability of the incumbents to influence the outcome, the ability of like a major brokerage or a major landlord or a major office owner to determine who's successful amongst a bunch of early stage companies is very high. So our strategy was, well, why don't we go out and raise a fund and partner with the biggest real estate companies across the different subsectors of the industry and brokerage and retail and multifamily and industrial. And that way we could really influence the outcome. So it's kind of a very much a, a top down approach to venture. Makes sense. Um, Sean, you, you run like is it six different accelerators. Yeah, uh, so yeah, is Hacks, which is the world's largest hardware accelerator, IndieBio, the world's leading biotech accelerator, uh, a few others. I, I think, you know, the, the advantage to having a vertical uh, focus 
is just being able to say no. You know, uh, I, I think we tell. I love saying no. You know, you know, we tell our investors. Uh, you know, uh, you know, our portfolio companies. We we tell them all the time. Focus, focus, focus. You know, just say no to anything that's not core and strategic. And you know, as investors, we have to follow that same discipline. So. You know, I know it's, you know, we, ha we run a, a variety of different verticals, but if you add up all of our verticals, we're still only like 28% of, of investable companies. So at least, you know, three quarters of the time, we're saying no to, to people wh wh when they come to us, with, you know, because it's just not a match. And the benefit to our companies is that when we are focused on these areas, when we know that, you know, say pharmaceuticals or, you know, medical devices or, you know, robotics or you know all, all the things that we do in hardware or whatever when we know these really really deeply we can really help them uh, you know hugely by by introductions to the right industry partners and everything else all the verticals would have that benefit you know being able to hook the hook our customers up to revenue sources better and hook them up to later stage uh, you know financers that will be more apt to want to invest makes sense. Dan, you came over, you were at uh, Highland Capital before, uh, which is more of a generalist firm. How did you find the transition to uh, being more focused? Yeah, so I, I was, uh, I <coughs> excuse me, I was a generalist when I was out here in, in the Bay Area for Highland, but actually my legacy was uh, actually on the East Coast. I worked out of Highland's Boston office for about four and a half years where we were sector focused. And I actually got spoiled by that. And I, I, you know, it was much easier to you know, find interesting companies when you had that focus. You could say no to things that didn't fit. Um, I felt like it was easier to sell into deals that were competitive because you were selling against folks who you know, might not have the expertise in the area that you're, you're focused on. And you could just build a brand a little bit faster. Um, so when I decided I wanted to start my own firm, I thought, gosh, if you're starting to build a brand from scratch, probably a lot easier if you're focused on a sector and you can leverage that expertise and y you know you don't you know try to build a generalist brand so Jason I got a different question for you um, on so Jason runs Saster which is SaaS focused uh, sort of the next question I wanted to ask about is LPs I think for on the fintech side and real estate there's some natural groupings of LPs that are focused around fintech and and real estate and, and the stuff Sean does as well um, how is it for SaaS what's your what's your LP base I, in, in terms of L LPs, I don't, I don't think there's any natural grouping around LPs. Um, and I think the LPs that I have are best of breed endowments um, uh, and best of breed SaaS VCs in some cases and, and others. Um, so I don't think there's a natural grouping for LPs. In fact, I would say that even something like SaaS, which is now a, a fairly mature category we all know, in many yep. cases is too differentiated for LPs. Uh, I don't know that it is for my LPs, but Many of the larger LPs I've met over time, I mean, they have IT and biotech, and you can get into enterprise and enterprise software. And when you start saying SaaS, like, you're starting to kind of get a little bit more nuanced. Um, so I don't think it's helpful at all. I do think that the one thing that has changed with LPs over the last couple of years is deal flow is dead. Uh, when I f first got into venture, all the LPs I met initially were talking about proprietary deal flow. We all can laugh now. Every VC on planet Earth, certainly in the Bay Area, can take 60 meetings a week, feel proud of themselves, and run the fund into the ground, right? So the best LPs no longer ask about proprietary deal flow. They want to know, why will the best founders pick you? Why will the best founders pick you? And one way to do it is to have a brand in a vertical, and it's one reason some founders will pick you, which is the magic to outsize returns. Great. So um, can you talk about that? Like just diving a little bit deeper, was that, is that all part of your strategy? Like, was, from the beginning, um, I guess you're very active on Quora, was that yes. always, is that, all, all of this media attention, is this all to get people to pick you in this ass vertical? No, I started building a community before I started investing, um, and then uh, I did, and then I realized um, th that the world had changed, and that what had happened since I exited my last company as a founder in 2011 is founders got all the power down to the earliest days, like down to pre-500 startups, pre-YC, pre-everything. And that uh, if, if, my, if I was gonna be a picker, like a 2008 Sanyo VC, I was going to, I was going to that's, a, that's a recipe for death to be a picker, right? No one yeah. drives up and down Sand Hill with the hottest company out of 500 startups. It just doesn't happen anymore. Beg, I had to beg for money twice as a founder. I, my first startup in 03, I had to sell 90% to the VCs with a 5x um, uh, 
uncapped participating preferred and oh, signed a $750,000 personal full recourse note <laughs> to the company when I had 20,000 in savings, okay? Fortunately, in the dot bomb days, those days are behind us and top tier VCs don't ask for that anymore. These were top, top VCs. Um, but you gotta be picked, so um, th that's, that, that's the, the Zen learning. Makes sense. Um, what about, like, so those are, those are great advantages for being highly vertical focused. Are there, are there any disadvantages that you guys see, Brandon? Um, yeah, there's, there's absolutely disadvantages, right? Which is a huge portion of investable deals are just not an option for you. So kind of how, how we look at our space is we're real estate and hospitality technology. So we can kind of invest at will in anything that's real estate or hospitality technology at any stage. How, how, how much does that stretch? What's, what's the most outside investment you've made that doesn't necessarily well, fit? Well, we that? literally closed our fund three weeks ago. Okay. So <laughs> no precedence. Um, but it can be anything from seed all the way up to kind of pre-IPO. I think what we also look for, and it sounds like you do as well, Constance, we look for deal that deals that are strategic for our anchors. So they're deals that might not actually fit into what you think of traditionally as real estate tech, but they're very strategic for a real estate investor. Who are your um, anchors? Uh, so our anchors, what we did is we kind of, as I said, surveyed the real estate space, and we said, who are the biggest players in each of the major food groups? Uh, so CBRE in brokerage and real estate services, Prologis in industrial, they're the largest industrial REIT, Macerich, it's the third largest shopping mall owner in the U.S. Lennar is the second biggest home builder. Uh, Rudin Management, a big office uh, developer and owner in New York. Um, and Harvard Management Company's real estate endowment. And we're about to bring in a few other brands in the office and hospitality and multifamily side. So the aim is that we kind of work very closely with them. And one thing I think that is an advantage to your, to your kind of point around, you know, you don't just want to be a picker. In our case, what we try to do is leverage asymmetric information that we have from our anchor investors, who are oftentimes the biggest buyers of the technologies in the market. So we say, okay, there's three players out there. You've piloted all of them. Which ones are you planning on adopting? And that's the kind of asymmetric information where you can start to play kingmaker and really influence outcomes and have the ability to go to an entrepreneur and get into deals you otherwise wouldn't. It's that access it gives you. Makes sense. Constance, I guess same question. Like, you have, you have similar LP, a similar LP base? What's yeah, so we have a lot of strategic um, investors as well. Um, Realogy is, is our largest investor. They have uh, a $5 billion company. They own Century 21, Coldwell Banker, Better Homes Garden, Sotheby's, ERA. They do about 35% of all residential transactions in the U.S. Um, we have a commercial group um, in D.C. We've got, uh, you know, I guess, similar, um, some of the overlapping, some different um, uh, kind of categories as, um, as Grey Wolf. Um, we also have um, uh, some large family offices. If they tend to have real estate holdings, they understand the technology side of the business. If yeah. they have a proclivity to venture, they really like our, our returns. Um, so... But I think that the biggest um, sort of disadvantage of this is that we tend to get pigeonholed into, say, real estate, where we really get focused on those companies that have, like I said, applicability in the area, but that can go elsewhere. And so people think of us and they think, oh, it's real estate tech, that's what you should do. But really, when I think about our landscape of investing, I look at it as a landscape of there's 600,000 SMBs in this industry. There's um, million and a half independent contractors. There's thousands of enterprise companies. So if there's a technology that services that, you know, many of your portfolio companies, Dan's, Dan and I have done deals together, you know, <laughs> like everyone around this, um, in this panel, a lot of people out here, you know, have companies that are like that. And I think we tend to get pigeonholed as like, oh, it's not real estate related, but really we're, we're much broader than that. And it's, it's a matter of, um, I think, educating people that if it is a technology that can help service the SMB market and enterprise and independent contractors, it makes sense for us. Yeah, makes sense. Sean, um, it seems like a lot of the, the stuff that you do is so, like, I would say frontier that if you weren't doing it, these companies might not exist. Is that, is that true? Well, yeah, actually, um, that's, that is true. We, we, with the biotech accelerator that we have, uh, you know, we made a $5 million investment into building out a wet lab facility here in San Francisco, 
Most VCs don't do that. Uh, as a matter of fact, we're the only one that's ever done it. Um, and well, not if it's from my fees. What was that? Not if it's from my management fees. Yeah, I yeah. Mean, I'll find another way. Yeah, well, if you find another way to do that, uh, but, but you know, so that we we it's a lot of money. We found a way to do that. So, um, and you know, before what we did, uh, I mean, basically, what what's happened before in the in the software marketplace is that yeah, it became affordable for people to start up. You yep. know, you have the tech stars and the 500 and YC and all that for regular software accelerators, and it doesn't take but $100,000 to, to get somebody to traction if they're really good and they have a good prototype and they get into your program. Uh, but if you are a scientist, you know, uh, that's trying to come up, you know, with a cure for, say, metastatic uh, pancreatic cancer or, you know, uh, an, a, uh, an artificial uh, um, liver, um, which uh, we have both of those in our I existing cohort, you wouldn't do that unless you could go and further the science, de-risk the science, and de-risk the marketplace all uh, in the same place. So we, we made some, uh, a bet that said, okay, we can run an accelerator that works for verticals, you know, and we started that with hacks uh, in Shenzhen, China, uh, and we took that uh, concept to biotech as well. And, and because of that, you know, scientists for the first time in, in a postdoc land can actually apply to an accelerator program, get enough capital, uh, a quarter of a million dollars, uh, to get them a year uh, worth of runway uh, to, to try to make a, a go of it. And we've had a, a tremendous amount of, um, uh, of follow-on uh, funding success in that uh, already. So and who are your LPs? Are they, I'm assuming they're different for each of the funds? So some of them, well, no, there's only one fund. Okay. So it's one fund for all, okay. all the things. So some of them are financial uh, investors, uh, and some are strategics. Some are actually other VCs using us to scout. We invest in 150 uh, companies a year, that, uh, $50 million a, a year that we're investing into these companies that go through the accelerators and their secondary follow-on uh, capital that we, we, we put in. Um, so we, um, our strategics are, you know, three multinational, uh, you know, uh, corporations with interests in one or more of the accelerators. Uh, we have, uh, you know, six VCs that, that, that are using us sort of as a scout network uh, to get, you know, we get 4,000 applications a year to get into one of our vertical accelerators and they're trying to have us give some deal flow to them uh, from the companies that we qualify through the accelerator program, et cetera. Cool. Um, Dan, is there something in FinTech that makes it particularly well suited to being a vertical, a, a vertical specific fund or, or working with FinTech companies? Yeah, sure. I mean, I, <coughs> and I'm just telling you things you already know, but uh, for the audience, um, obviously financial services is a super regulated industry. And uh, most fintech startups have to work with banks or regulated financial institutions. So you know, there's a lot of specialized knowledge um, to being a fintech investor, I think. And, and candidly, I think we're seeing that play out in fintech right now. There were a lot of people who thought they were investing in fintech companies that were really investing in financial services companies. Um, so really understanding you know, kind of the nuances of, of an industry is pretty important. And it's one of the reasons why being vertically focused is, um, is an advantage. Um, but we see that in both of the, the industries that we focus on. Uh, it's pretty important to understand th those nuances. Jason, uh, when I think about like a Series A investor in SaaS, I think basically you need to know like five numbers, and then it, and then like a spreadsheet could invest for me. Um, wh There's what a lot do you of think about that? that? <laughs> okay, yeah, w tell me about that. What do you what do you think? Is is that a myth or is that true? I wish I was a SaaS investor because it'd be a lot easier. I I mean I do late mostly late seed. So my goal is for someone much larger than me within 12 months to write a check at two to five X what I pay within 12 months. And there's a formula, and you need a certain amount of growth and a certain amount of revenue. You Teach need us your ways. What's that? Teach us your ways, what's the formula? You, you want to get up to 200,000 or more in monthly revenue, growing 10% or a month, more or more, in a relatively hot category with a very charismatic CEO with at least one good person on the management team. So my job when I invest <laughs> is I, I can get the CEO, uh, my goal is to help you grow faster by going up market. My goal is to give you your entire first management team within 90 days, and then to help promote you so that you have visibility so that the next guys can, can write an eight-figure check. Um, but it is a formula. It's not, I mean, as you get, get later, obviously, the, the bar goes up. But if you hit the bar, right, the bar goes up, it, it's, it, you know, you get funded in a week. That's great. Um, if. If, <laughs> if, yeah, if yeah, you yeah. hit the bar. 
it's the, as you go, I mean, the, the number, it, it does become, put differently, a friend of mine, maybe a friend of ours that does B2C and B2B said, uh, I put my more junior partner on SAS because it's much easier to understand. <laughs> <laughs> um, cool, that's, that's super cool. Um, what are, uh, could you, I, now I might want to talk about a little bit about your investments. Um, would each of you uh, tell me your favorite investment and why? DocuSign. DocuSign. Ooh, we've got we've got. It's a good investment. <laughs> <laughs> R relatively high burn rate, and on their six CEO. But other than that, pretty pretty good one. Brendan. Wow. Uh, it is a good one. If people will make a lot of money, it'll be worth four billion or more. So uh, before starting Fifth Wall, I did deals through a smaller angel fund, uh, which is basically a bunch of angelist syndicates called Grey Wolf. And we focused also on real estate and hospitality tech. And we found this company, Clutter, early on, which is basically on-demand self-storage. So as opposed to lugging your stuff to a self-storage facility and dropping it off there and dealing with the monthly or yearly rate What makes them better than all the others in that space? What's that? What makes them better than all the others in that space? Uh, all the obvious things, you know, better management, better growth story, um, kind of more focused, I'd say more focused direction. But I think initially out of the gates, one of the things they were very focused on is long-term stored items, not boxes. Yep. So a lot of the other players were focused on getting your winter sweaters and your skis away for a few months. But that's a very expensive proposition to be getting that stuff back and forth. Whereas Clutter was focused on your sofas and your your grand pianos, which tend to be a little more sticky. Um, but that business we found early on, we helped seed it, um, and Sequoia just did their last two rounds. Um, but it's a really interesting model of, when you think of real estate tech, sometimes you think of pure enterprise SaaS, like true technology for the real estate industry, like ERP for real estate. But increasingly, these businesses like Airbnb, or WeWork, or Clutter, they're these weird hybrids of technology and real estate, like what is clutter? It's still storing your stuff, just like a real estate yeah. business, but it's like a technology company. Or like, what's WeWork? Is it really a startup? It's kind of like a real estate company. Or is Airbnb the biggest hospitality brand, or is it just a marketplace? Mm. There's kind of these big existential questions that are being raised at the intersection of what we think of as the commercialization of space and technology. And that's what I think is the most interesting theme in real estate tech today. And that's that's why I say, you know, the, the getting pigeonholed in a certain way, but like using DocuSign as an sure, example, yeah. it's a quintessential example of how it's not real estate, but it makes total sense in real estate, but also everywhere else. And, you know, many of the in clutter, it's not real estate, but it makes sense in that regard. And, you know, and, and, and so there's, there's a lot of technologies out there like that. Sean? Uh, I'll give you a quick three-part three, three part answer. Uh, right. In the past, um, uh, you know, uh, th something we got a nice 70 times return on was a uh, uh, company called Guitar Hero, or it's, it's called Harmonix. They did Guitar Hero and Rock Band. Uh, it was a great uh, thing. I'm actually, I'm still in that. We just took the company private and, and, and we're reinvesting in that. But uh, gift that keeps giving. Um, and the current uh, time uh, at 5 o'clock today, we should be getting a 16 to 1 return on a a current investment, but it's it's 40 minutes from now, so I shouldn't say what that uh, investment <laughs> is. And then in the in the future, uh, there's a uh, company that just graduated, FoodX, which is uh, our disruptive food accelerator in New York, and they it's a company called Plasma Nutrition, and that's a company that uh, does uh, it, it has a way of processing uh, whey protein uh, that makes it absorbable by the human body, and the recent uh, trial, human trial, uh, with uh, 40 uh, people that was just done last month, indicates that b bodybuilders using regular whey protein versus bo bodybuilders using this one, uh, plasmified uh, whey protein, um, got 204% greater ma uh, muscle mass uh, in the same uh, period of time. So basically, we could give it to the Olympi U.S. Olympic team and win, win every gold medal uh, for, for every uh, sport if, uh, if they have this proprietary Did they technology. test positive? Uh, oh, yeah, no, no, it's not. It's just <laughs> whey. It's the same. <laughs> it's just whey protein. It's like just protein. So, but they have a way of processing it, so, you know, plasmifying it so the body can absorb it really, really well. It's r remarkable. So that, that those are th th three cool. quick examples. I think that one's my favorite company, too. <laughs> <laughs> no. 
Um, a favor is a tough word. I don't use it but, uh, very often. But um, I definitely one of our early investments that I, I, I love and is really exemplative of, uh, of our strategy is a company called Retail Next, which um, you know, retail analytics business, it's the leader in its space. Um, it was a result of talking to you know, nearly a dozen companies all trying to do, go after the same space in different ways um, and just picking the company that was trying to build a platform, had a great team. And is now, you know, really shown has, has pulled away from the pack. It will do over thirty million in revenues this year, uh, mostly recurring revenue. You know, generating, you know, booking eight-figure deals routinely. So, um, pretty compelling one. I, I I love them all. I don't have any favorites, um, but uh, I guess I'll pick two from five hundred startups. So, so Talkdesk and Algolia, which yeah. are both five hundred. I was the first institutional investor in Talkdesk a after you, and the first U.S. investor in Algolia. And um, those were that's where I learned about being picked. And both of them had, for different reasons, had infinite options even for funding, even in the early days. And I, I'm grateful that they picked me. And when I did those two 500 startup, then I, I stopped doing any founders that didn't pick me. Um, so, but I, I, lo I love them all. Um, and uh, whether they're doing 30 million or 3 million or 0.3, it's uh, if you if you're if you're with what I learned. Is if you're on this journey as a as a founder turned investor, if you work with a founder that's better than you, it's always great. And I've done two investments out of 23 where the founders weren't better than me. They're both doing fine, and those are my worst investments. Like they're not. You want to work with people that are better than you. That's the to me. That's the real joy in this job. Did you know it early on? What's that? Did you know that they were worse than you? The two? Yeah. Yeah, I knew. Yeah. You did, you one, did. one I knew for sure, um, but they had traction. Um, and the other one. It wasn't clear, <laughs> um, uh, but but the Tiago at Talkdesk and Nicholas at Algolia from 500, yeah. it was clear somewhere between 11 and 20 minutes in the conversation they were much better than me as a founder. Do you find that there's something specific to your vertical that I a founder needs to have, Dan? Like in, I'm curious. I mean, I mean, it's all the regular stuff that you'd expect a founder to, to, to have, of course, which is the ability to recruit people, the ability to recruit investors. Um, but in the two industries we're in, it's also like a degree of, you know, persistence and, uh, and, 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 you know, longevity that may not be relevant in, in other industries or in consumer facing businesses. Um, you know, having to deal with banks, having to deal with regulators, um, having to sell into retail IT. I mean, those are just long, arduous processes and you have to be patient. Um, so we're looking for people who can do that. Cool. I was saying in real estate, I think it all comes down to unfair advantages around distribution. Real yeah. estate tech has been a space where really, really bad products have had massive traction and adoption because someone big adopted them first. No one knows who. And they probably wish they could kill them right now. <laughs> you haven't like used uh, SAP or other pro. I mean, <laughs> you think it's unique to real estate? <laughs> it's <laughs> called <laughs> software. It's, it's yeah, called software. No, I'm with you. It may be worse than the worst Banking of all. It's probably, yeah, it's probably a little the bit worse. And, and I think that what really matters for some of these young, especially enterprise real estate technologies is if you can build a relationship early on with one of the key institutional owners and either get an investment from them or a distribution deal with them because it's kind of an industry where everyone looks to their left and looks to their right and sees what everyone else is doing and then they just adopt. Um, and so staying ahead of that kind of herd mentality is really important in real estate. Cool. Um, unfortunately, we have to wrap up the panel. That was awesome. Thank you, guys. Thanks.